All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the gift of laughter and of marriage. Lord God, we thank you that we can listen to your word and be changed by it. Lord God, we ask that you open up our hearts, our ears, our minds, Lord God, to receive your message. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so we are on part like seven of the spiritual warfare series. Okay, you can catch up online, um, YouTube or SoundCloud. Um, or going by to our website, it, it has all of that. Um, I've been having fun with it, but the thing about series and whenever you get into spiritual warfare stuff, guess what starts to happen? Spiritual warfare starts to happen. I knew that going in, and I don't like it. Because it's not like I sit here and I say, hmm, let me see. What series am I going to start on now? No, it's usually like, I'm going into this because I'm going through it. And most of my sermons, if not all of them, come out of stuff that I go through and personal Bible study and then it ends up becoming a sermon. So you can really go, go back and see all the sermons and what I name things. You can see what I go through in my life. <laughs> Notice I stay on repentance a lot. <laughs> Ephesians 6 lays out our, uh, where we're at, and we're on verse 17. It says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Okay, before all of that, it tells us to put on the whole armor of God. Okay, the belt of truth, we did that first, and then it's the breastplate of righteousness. Then it was, if anybody remembers, the shoes of the gospel of peace. And then last week we did the shield of faith. Now we're on the helmet, okay? So when a soldier is suited up for battle, the helmet was the last piece of armor to go on, okay? It was the final act of readiness in preparation for combat. A helmet was vital for survival. Okay, it protected what? The brain, the head. Okay, we know that if we get hit in the head, those guys who work in the oil field, what do you have to do? You have to wear what? Hard hats to protect your noggin, okay? Because if you get hit in the head, it can knock you out, it can kill you. You know, you'll be decapitated and then a soldier that gets his head knocked off, like literally, it's not any good for any kind of combat, okay? So if the head was badly damaged, the rest of the armor didn't matter, okay? Now, why is it that he's telling us to take the helmet of salvation and put that on last if salvation is something so important? Because the assurance of our salvation is what he's talking about. The assurance of our salvation is impenetrable defense against anything that the enemy throws at us. Okay, Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, Do not fear those who can heal the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. He's not talking about Satan. Okay? Satan is not the king of hell. Okay, Satan is not God's arch enemy. They're not on equal playing fields. He's, you know this heretical picture that everybody puts out on Facebook? You know, share this and be blessed. Ignore if you love the devil and it's Jesus and the devil arm wrestling. Not even close to how it is. Like, they're not equal forces, okay? It's not like an election. You know, they used to have these tracts that people would give out. And, you know, there's... there's there's a, uh, an election and you have the final vote. You know, the devil is, uh, you know, campaigning for your soul just like God is. And I don't like whenever they try to esteem Satan up to the same thing because he's not. Okay. So what he's talking about right here, do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. He's talking about God. Yep. <laughs> Saying fear God because God can destroy both the body and the soul. 
Okay? Now, as we prepare for Satan's attacks, we got to grab the helmet and buckle it on tightly. Okay? Salvation is not limited. Now, listen to the wording. Okay? Salvation is not limited to a one-time act of the past or even the future or the present. God's salvation is an ongoing, eternal state that His children enjoy in the present right now. Okay, it's daily protection and deliverance from our sin nature and Satan's schemes. Okay, the fifth piece of God's armor is represented by a helmet. Okay, which without it, we can never enter into a battle. Okay, modern day soldiers wear a helmet also. It just looks different than back then. Okay, now some of the helmets that in Paul's time, they were made out of thick leather covered with metal plates, and they were heavily molded with metal and stuff like that. And they usually had some cheek pieces to protect the face here. And the purpose of the helmet was to protect the head from injury. Okay? Now you gotta think, they had different kind of swords. They had small swords that were sharp, and then they had these big, long, broad swords that were like three to four foot long that these guys would come and, I mean, if they would hit you with that, they would, even if they wouldn't cut your head off, it would badly damage you. Okay, so the helmet protected them from this. Okay, now the fact that the helmet is related to salvation indicates that Satan blows are directed at the believer's security. Yeah. And his assurance in Christ. Yeah. See, we have to walk around with, a, with an assurance of salvation. If someone asks you, are you sure that if you die right now, you're going to heaven and being with Jesus, you should be able to say yes. If you say, I don't know, or no, then you're no good in combat because you're not even a soldier. And then there's no wonder why you're getting your brains kicked in. Literally. Literally. See, the two dangerous edges of, spirit, of Satan's spiritual sword are discouragement and doubt. If he could discourage you and he could make you doubt, if he, if he could give you some discouragement in your walk with Christ, and he could give you some doubt about anything that the Bible says or even your salvation, he got you. Okay? One of the ways he discourages us, he points out all of our failures. Points out all of our sins. Points out all of our unresolved problems, our poor health, or whatever else seems negative in our lives in order to make us lose confidence in the love and the care of our Heavenly Father. <laughs> Me and... Uh, you know, Casey, I tell her to this a lot. I said, I don't need people to tell me how bad I am. The devil reminds me every day. Amen. It's called condemnation. Yep. Condemnation creeps in and tells you, you know, you're not worthy enough to preach the gospel. Me and whenever me and my wife fight, it's like, look, you disqualified right there. Your house is not in order. That's not from God. It's straight from the devil. You know, or whenever I mess up, see? And you're going to get up and preach in front of everybody? If I would listen to that voice, I would never preach. I would never do anything for the kingdom. But I have an assurance of my salvation. I have an understanding that I know that that's not from God. That God is not telling me these things. That is the enemy trying to cast doubt and discouragement. Okay? Whenever someone first gets saved, you know, they get excited. And it's like, don't ever lose that excitement. You got to keep it. It's like passion. You know, it's like a fire that builds up. And you got to keep on putting wood on the fire for the fire to keep on. Okay? Same thing in a marriage. Okay? When you first get together, hey, it's like bunny rabbits. Yeah. <laughs> and then it gets to be like turtles. <laughs> Why? Because the passion died out. 
okay? So you cannot lose your passion. You got to keep your passion burning. You got to keep that on fire with the Lord, okay? You got to keep that hunger for the Lord and the things of his kingdom, okay? The first thing that will happen after someone gets saved, and you can, you can sit back and almost gauge it. They get up, 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 high and everything. The grass is greener. The sun is brighter. Nobody can tell them nothing. They just awesome. And then first discouragement usually happens within about two weeks. And then they're like, to hell with this. Or the excitement wears off. And I hear this from tons of people. I'm just bored now. It's like because you're, you're, you're letting the devil creep in and get you off track. Okay, you remember that excitement you had two weeks ago? Three weeks ago? A month ago? Six months ago? You got to keep that. Okay? See, what happens is we, we are forgiven by God. Okay? When we repent. Forgiven by God. 100% of the time, we don't forgive ourselves for all the crap we did. Amen. And we stay in self-condemnation. Yep. Right. Right. And then it's compiled by the devil and the enemy telling you how bad you are. And then you're remembering all the bad stuff you did. And then he tells you. And then it just pushes you down. And then and you know what ends up happening? You stop coming to church. You stop coming to Wednesday night service, you stop, you start isolating yourselves, because isolation is where the devil wants you. If the devil can get you isolated, he got you. Then you just his little play toy, and he can play with your mind all he wants. And that's his main goal. His main goal is to get you isolated. I texted somebody yesterday, and they said, am I in trouble? I said, no. Why, you did something to be in trouble? They said, I'm just not used to have a pastor texting me and seeing how I am. I said, well, I hadn't heard from you. Because if the devil can get you in isolation, guess what? He got you. Okay? All of my friends in recovery, you know that all too well. You can always tell when someone's getting ready to relapse, they start pulling away. I mean, coming from an ex-addict, it's like, you ain't going to pull one over on me. I've been there. I might give you enough rope, because I think sometimes you need to touch some relapse. So you can see how good you really got it. It's kind of like, hey, don't eat that turd right there. And they keep going to it. Hey, don't eat that turd. And they keep going. It's all right, well, eat it. And then they're like, ugh, there you go. Now you know. It's like a kid, don't ever let me watch your kid. Because I only tell them two or three times not to touch the fire. Don't touch the fire, it's hot. Don't touch the fire, it's hot. All right, touch it. And then I guarantee you after they touch it, they won't do it again. Sometimes you got to let people mess up so they can see where they at. That's the hardest thing about being a pastor is knowing when to say no, stop, don't, and when to say okay. But you don't back off completely. You still watch over. But sometimes you got to let them slip up so they can see, so they can taste it and go, yeah, I don't want none of that again. And it happens. Okay? Now, the biggest thing with all of this in the discouragement is to never stay in discouragement. Okay, you got to know, you got to know that you're secure in your salvation, that you have eternal security, that you have an assurance of salvation. That way, whenever those doubts and all that stuff tries to trickle in, you know how to combat it. Okay. Now, since Paul is addressing believers here in Ephesians, putting on the helmet of salvation cannot refer to receiving Christ as Savior. Because you already have it. So how can you put on something you already have? Okay? The only ones who can take up any piece of God's armor 
are the ones who are already involved in the supernatural struggle against Satan and his demonic forces. Those who are already saved. You cannot put on the armor of God if you are not saved. So why are we putting on the helmet of salvation last? Because it's not talking about your initial salvation. Okay, the Bible says you are saved. You're in the process of being saved and you will be saved. What? Yet people who aren't good at exegeting scripture and they'll say, well, are we saved or are we will be saved? Or are we in the process of being saved? Yes. <laughs> what? Yes. You're saved. You're in the process of being saved and you will be saved. What? Amen. Yes. That's what the Bible says. Okay. So trusting in Jesus. Okay. And we are getting saved. Now, what are we saved from? The wrath of God. Okay, you're saved from God's wrath. Okay, so when we are initially saved, okay, we are brought out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are instantly saved. We are justified. Our spirit is saved right there. Okay, you die, guess where you're going? To heaven. Okay, that starts a process called sanctification. Okay. So we are justified. We're instantly saved. Our spirit is saved. But our soul yeah, come on. is not saved. No. Come on. Our soul is in the process of being saved. Amen. Amen. What is our soul? Mind, will, and emotions. Yes. Okay? That's why you can see someone who gets saved, turn their life over to the Lord, get baptized, and then struggle. Doesn't mean that they're not saved. It means that they're starting their sanctification process. Okay? So you are saved. Your spirit is instantly saved. Your soul is in the process of being saved. And then when you die, your body gets saved. That's glorification. Okay? Now I'm going to give you all the scripture to back up everything I just said. Okay? Now, for believers... The first aspect of salvation, which is justification, is past. Okay? It is accomplished the moment we put our faith in Jesus Christ. That particular act of faith never needs to be repeated again. What? You mean I don't rededicate my life to the Lord? You mean I don't get saved again? That means you got unsaved first time? If you did, and that's what you was taught, you were taught wrong. John 10, 28 to 29. This is Jesus talking. He says, I give them. What does eternal mean? Again. All right. And what's the next words? And they will? Never. Never. Okay. So, if you can lose something, like salvation, wouldn't the wording here be a little bit different? I give you, I give them life until they mess up. And they may never perish if they don't mess up. What it says, I give them eternal, eternal life and they will never, never perish. And wait, wait, wait. Ever. What's the next words? No. No. How many? No. We'll snatch them out of my hand. Not the devil, not your past, and not yourself. Amen. Yourself is included in that no one. Because he would say, everyone, no one can do it except the person themselves. Right? No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Okay? So, when we come to know Christ as our Savior, we are brought into a relationship with God that, he, that secures our eternal security. Okay? Jude Verses 24 to 25 says, Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, 
blameless with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Okay? So God's power is able to keep the believer from falling. It's up to him, not us, to present us to his glorious presence. It's not up to us. Because listen, if it would be up to you, you would screw it up. Remember your life before Jesus came into it? Was it good? Then why do you need Jesus after? If it's up to you. If it be up to you, Jesus came and died for no reason. Then we could just save ourselves. If we'd be underneath our own goodness and our own glory and our own power. But it's not. It's all up to God. He's the one who saves us and he's the one who keeps us. It says it right here. To him, big H, him, who is able to protect you from stumbling. Okay? So our eternal security is a result of God keeping us, not us maintaining our salvation, but him maintaining our salvation. Because if we had to maintain our salvation, then it would be a works-based salvation. And we wouldn't have been able to gain it to start off with. It would be grace that we'd be saved by. It would be works. The Bible specifically says, you are saved by grace, not through works, so that no one can boast. Amen. Okay? The Lord said this, John 10, 27, 29. He says, my sheep hear my voice. Yes. Amen. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So guess what? If someone is not following Jesus, Come on. not everybody that comes to the church is a sheep. There's full of goats, there's full of dogs, there's full of pigs, and there's wolves. The wolves don't last long. Well, not here. I got a good wolf detector. Where's my staff? You know why? You know why a shepherd's staff was long like that? So when the wolves come, it can pop it in the mouth and knock his teeth out. The Bible calls us to do the same thing to false teachers. Not physically, spiritually. I wish it would be physically sometimes, but because some of you really want to just, I just want to just shut up. You're sending people to hell. Shut up. Yeah. So my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Okay? I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father has given to me is greater than all. No one will snatch them out of the Father's hand. Okay, so both Jesus and the Father has us firmly grasped in his hand. Who could possibly separate us from the love of both the Son and the Father? Okay, Jesus tells us that he gives eternal life to the sheep, the Christians. He clearly and definitely states that they shall never perish. There's no qualifier here. There's no statement such as they will, shall never perish if they continue being good. If they continue going to church, if they continue acting right. There's no ifs here. Okay? The only clear declaration is that they shall never perish. The inability to perish is a result of the Lord Jesus giving them eternal life. Okay? Now Jesus says no one will snatch them out of his hand. That further emphasized the idea that those who have eternal life will never perish. Ain't not one of y'all excited about that. <laughs> I just told you. It's not about you. You're going to mess it up if it was... Now listen, seriously. Do you want your family and your children's salvation based on them? No. No, no because I know how some of your children act. <laughs> no, my kids are. No. I know how I am. No. Oh, 
I know I would mess up my salvation. <laughs> because if you could lose your salvation, you would. That, that's a 100% true statement. If you could lose your salvation, you would. Okay? Ephesians 4.30 And don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by Him for the day of redemption. Okay, so that tells us that believers are sealed for the day of redemption. If believers did not have eternal security, the sealing would not be truly until the day of redemption. It'd be until the day you mess up. You'd have to unbreak the seal that the Holy Spirit put on you. So it would say, you do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for until the day you mess up. Or the day of your disbelief or the first day you sin. Okay, John 3, 15 and 16 says, So that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Okay, there's that eternal word again. Amen. So whoever believes in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. If a person were to be promised eternal life but then have it taken away, it was never eternal to begin with. If eternal security is not true, the promises of eternal life in the Bible would be an error. And we know that the Bible is not an error. Amen. And I ask this question all the time. Okay, let's say we can lose our salvation. When? Amen. What sin? What sin is so great that the blood of Jesus could cover us to get us saved but not keep us covered? Is the blood of Jesus that weak? No, no, no. It's power. Amen. Every sin that a man can commit against God and man, even the most heinous, was dealt at the cross. Amen. It was done with. Our eternal security is based on God's love for whom he has redeemed. Our eternal security is purchased by Christ, promised by the Father, and sealed by the Holy Spirit. And those who are indwelt with the Holy Spirit seek to war against their sin and not abide in their sin. Those who declare that they are eternally secure will seek to get rid of as much sin as they can in their life. See, when the Holy Spirit dwells within you when you try to sin you have something called conviction that happens cartoons like to depict it as the evil inside the little devil and the angel and most of the time in the cartoons they follow the devil okay you can you can take that that depiction and put it as your flesh and the holy spirit and when you have a choice to make, you can even do what your flesh tells you to do or what your spirit tells you to do. Okay, and when you mess up, your spirit will convict you and say, hey, you need to repent of this. This is not the way to go. This is wrong. Okay? So those, 1 John 2, 4, and 5 says, the one who says, I have come to know him, yet does not keep his commands as a liar and the truth is not in him. It does not say that because we keep his commands, we know him. It says just the opposite. Yeah. Because we know him, we keep his commands. Right. Okay, keeping the commands will not get you into heaven. It's called religion. Religion teaches you do this, 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 and this. Don't do this and you'll get here. The relationship with Jesus says, I love you, and I want you to be part of the family, and then you keep all this stuff because you're a part of the family. There's a difference. Okay? 
So it says, the one who says, I've come to know him, yet does not keep his commands as a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly in him the love of God is perfected. This is how we know we are in him. Amen. Okay? So the second aspect of our salvation is sanctification. Okay? That deals with our soul. Okay, and what is the soul built upon? Mind, will, and emotions. Okay? So during this time on earth, we experience a measure of freedom from the dominating power of sin in our lives. And that is done by us and the Holy Spirit. This is where you come in. It's so eager to come in. You want to so piss off some people? Tell them you're saved by grace, not by works. Nothing that you can do. Totally a work of God. They'll go, bull crap, it's my choice. No, it's not. Totally a work of God. And then they'll say, I'm not going to argue scripture with you because you ain't got none. And then they'll try to twist scripture and they'll throw out, well, John 3.16 says it. No, John 3.16 tells you what you're going to get, eternal life. It doesn't tell you that it's your choice to choose. Okay. It's like, why are you, why do you want that burden on you? I was so relieved when I found out that it was all the work of God and I didn't have no part in it. I'm like, hallelujah. I ain't going to mess this up. Exactly. And so here's the part where you come in. Okay. Being under God's grace, sin no longer has mastery or dominion over us. For we are no longer slaves to sin, but now we are God's slaves. Okay, Romans 6.14 says, For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. Okay, Romans 6.22 says, But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification, and it's in eternal life. Okay. So Paul shows these first two aspects of salvation side by side in the previous chapter in Romans 5, 10. He says, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. I love how it says that for while we were enemies, remember this, whenever you were unsaved, you weren't just an unsaved person lingering around in this world. You were an enemy of God. You were at war with God. And then you were reconciled to God by the death of his son. So much more now that we are reconciled shall be saved by his life. So Christ's death saved us once and for all from sin's penalty. That's the justification part. Okay? But now his life within us and how we are living throughout this life. We, we are being saved day to day. From sin's power that it had over us. Okay? The, so whenever we are going through this life, that's why you can see somebody on their way to church get road rage and curse somebody out. Did they lose their salvation? No. They failed in sanctification. Come on. None of y'all do that? None of y'all pass on Martin Luther King then on the way to church, right? Y'all use, yeah, Chris, darn it. Gosh, dog it. All poo. Come on. I had to talk with somebody yesterday, and they were telling me all the stuff that was happening and how they cursed out this person and all this. And I said, where were you going? They said, to church. I went, all right. I like, okay. It happens. Did that person lose their salvation because they cursed somebody out? No. Hurts their witness, right. But it does not lose your salvation. The blood of Jesus is not that fragile. 
Okay? It's not that fragile. God knew before he chose you that you were going to curse somebody out on the way to come to church. But at least you made it here. Okay? So throughout your life, until the day you die, you're in this process called sanctification. You're going to be walking it out. Okay? Your soul is in the process of being saved. Okay? Now, the third aspect of salvation is the future. The aspect of glorification. When we shall one day be saved altogether forever from sin's presence. Because we will be in the presence of Christ himself. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. Okay? To be like God is to be without sin. Okay? So whenever we are in his presence, because God cannot look upon any type of sin, we will be glorified. We will have our sinless perfection in him. We do not obtain that here on this earth. Okay? And people try to, and I watch these arguments all the time on Facebook, and I'm like, this is about the dumbest stuff ever. Where people say, I don't sin anymore. <laughs> And I usually want to go put on there, let me slap your wife across her face and tell me if you don't sin anymore. Because if you don't do me something, God, that pastor's violent. Listen, it's to prove a point. When people say, I don't sin anymore, they're lying to you. They're self-righteous. They're sinning and saying that. No one is perfect. That's right. Not one of us in here is perfect. Nor will we ever be as long as we in these mortal bodies. That's right. As long as we have these fleshly bodies, no one will ever receive perfection. Okay? We never arrive. We will always mess up to the day we die. Okay? Our body is constantly going through sanctification. We don't reach sinless perfection until we die and we are with Him. Okay? In glory. Alright? Romans 13, 11 says, Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. What salvation is He talking about? Our future salvation, where our bodies will be saved. Okay? The final aspect of salvation is the real strength of the believer's helmet. Okay? If we lose hope in the future promise of salvation, there can be no security in the present. Paul calls the same piece of armor the helmet of salvation. He also calls it the hope of salvation. 1 Thessalonians 5.8 he says, but since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Doesn't mean that we have a hope. We hope that when we die, we make it. Is that we're hoping for the day of salvation. Okay? We are secure in our salvation because we know that we are justified. We know we are going through our sanctification. And then we have the assurance that when we die, we will be with him in our glorified bodies. And he's calling it the hope of our salvation. Having the first fruits of the Spirit, Paul explains this in Romans 8, 23 and 24. He says that not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? So he's talking about an oncoming thing. Right. Not something that's here. Okay? 
The helmet of salvation is that great hope of final salvation, that glorification that gives us confidence and assurance that our present struggle with Satan will not last forever and we will be victorious in the end. Like I said, we are in a fixed fight. All we have to do is be standing when the bell rings. The fight is fixed. You don't believe me? Read Revelation. We win. Okay? We win. All we have to do is be standing when the bell rings. When Jesus says, hey, it's time. We have to be on the right side. Okay? Now, we know that the battle is only for this life. And even a long earthly life is no more than a split second compared to the eternal life we will have with the Lord in heaven. We are not in a race that we can lose. We're not in a battle that we can lose. We have no purgatory to face after we die. No uncertain hope that our own continued efforts or those of our loved ones and friends will perhaps someday finally make us acceptable to God. We have none of that. We have an assurance that the work that Christ did on the cross was enough. Okay? Romans 8, 28 to 30 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. There's that word justified, right? We were saved. And those whom he justified, he glorified. Okay. There is not, listen to this and listen to this good. Okay. There is not a single loss from one person not one single person is lost from predestination to justification to sanctification to glorification as hard as you of a thing for you to wrap your mind around on that it's very simple those whom he foreknew he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers And those whom he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he glorified. Okay, there's not one single person who is lost from predestination to justification to sanctification to glorification. Okay, John 6, 39 to 40 says, And this is the will of him who sent me. This is Jesus talking. The person who he's talking about is the Father, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. John John 10, 27, 30 again. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Okay, we keep on. The blood of Jesus. Now listen and take down this note. The blood of Jesus saves every and exactly every one, every person he wanted it to save. And those that it was meant to save, not one person less and not one person more. Because if someone would be lost from predestination to glorification, then the blood of Jesus failed. That's right. That's right. Come on. Men fail, yeah. religion fails, but yeah. Jesus never fails. Right. Remember that. That's right. If someone goes to hell, it's not because the blood of Jesus failed. The blood of Jesus saves everyone it was intended to save. Notice what he says. My sheep hear my voice. He doesn't say my goats hear my voice. He doesn't say the wolves hear my voice. He doesn't say the pigs hear my voice. He doesn't say the dogs hear my voice. He said my sheep hear my voice. 
I know them and they follow me. The problem with church is we spend too much time trying to change goats into sheep. Too many pastors are trying to entertain goats and entertain wolves and entertain dogs and entertain pigs while the sheep are getting ravaged by the wayside because we don't want to don't want to offend the wolves. Don't want to offend these religious people over here. Can't say that from the pulpit. You might make these people mad and they'll leave the church. Well, then there's goats. Bye. Bye. All the way out. Now, for those of you who don't know, we have sheep. Sheep are the called ones. Sheep are the people of God. Okay, then you have goats. Goats are the ones who look like the sheep, but really don't follow. Come on. Okay, a sheep and a goat might look alike, but a sheep follows the voice of the shepherd. Amen. A goat does what the hell it wants to do. A sheep eats only grass and a few select things, meaning it'll eat the word of God and a few select books and stuff like that. A goat eats anything you put its mouth on. Okay, we're not called to separate the sheep from the goats. God says he's going to do that in the end. The sheep are going to go to his right to heaven and the goats are going to go to the left to hell. It's not the pastor's job. It's not the shepherd's job to separate the sheep from the goats. That is the great shepherd's job to do that. Then in the church, you also have pigs. What are pigs? Pigs are the unrepentant people that will just waste your time. Because you can clean a pig up and put lipstick on it, and guess what? It's still a pig. And you know what it's going to do? It's going to go and waddle in the mud that you just got it out of and cleaned up off of it. Okay? And what does pigs eat? Slop. Stuff that has no substance whatsoever. But it just fills their belly. That's what an unrepentant person does. It eats a bunch of junk. That's what me and my wife call... Any kind of secular music and movies and stuff like that, it's like junk food. You don't want to base your entire meal around junk food. And some people don't eat any junk food. Some people eat a little bit. Some people eat way too much. Okay? And what happens if you eat too much junk food? You get fat like a pig. Okay? Same thing spiritually. If you eat too much junk food, guess what? You get unhealthy spiritually. Okay? Then you have the dogs. You know what the dogs are? Dogs that are religious people. The dogs who say, you tore in jeans and your skull shirts and your earrings and your tattoos, you be any reverent to the pulpit. Well, almost did something else. That was a thumb. Almost went two fingers over. I would. Okay? So, to the religious people, all right? That's the dogs. You're going to have dogs in the church, okay? You bark at them. You mock them. You make fun of them, okay? Paul told them to emasculate themselves, so I think mocking fits in perfectly. Jesus called them hypocrites, okay? And he did that publicly. You don't do that behind closed doors. You rebuke your fellow brother behind closed doors, not, not dogs. Dogs, you do it publicly. Amen. Then you got the wolves. The wolves are those who try to come in. And now wolves are not just misdirected people. Wolves are people who come in with an agenda to disrupt the congregation and to lead people astray. Okay? A good shepherd will knock the teeth out of the mouth of a wolf. Spiritually, you shut... A wolf up. That's right. The Bible calls us to call out false teachers Amen. and to shut them up. Yeah. And that's what you do. Yeah. Okay? And a good shepherd, that's the shepherd's job to distinguish who all these people are, where do they fit in a category, and to, to um, treat everybody according to their nature. Because if you're treating the wolves like the sheep, guess what's going to happen to the sheep? If you put a bunch of wolves in a sheep pen, how many sheep are you going to have left? 
Okay. If you put a bunch of pigs in a sheep pen, how many sheep are you going to have left? None. Okay. The only two that can play good together is goats and sheep. How many dogs? If you have a bunch of sheep. The dogs will devour the sheep. The wolves will devour the sheep. The pigs will devour the sheep. Don't think a pig won't eat a sheep. A pig will eat whatever. The chicken will too. The shepherd's job is to distinguish between all of this. Okay, Spurgeon, I think it was, that said uh, uh, a good shepherd should have two voices, one for the sheep and one for the wolves. Yeah, right. yeah. With the sh uh, Martin Luther, the reformer, said this. With a sheep, you can never be too gentle. And with a wolf, you cannot be too severe. And if most pastors would live by that, you'd have less false teaching from the pulpit and you'd have more sheep sitting in the, right. in the pews. Yeah. But when's the last time you heard a pastor call out a false teacher? Besides here. It's a lost art form. It's a lost art form. Because everybody wants to be nice, play well in the sake of unity, but I'm sorry. Unity with a religion or a false teacher that is sending people to hell is not unity at all. It's anti-gospel. It's anti-Christ. Okay? All right. Now, this, 1 Peter 1, 3 to 5 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guided, guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be, be revealed in the last time. Here it is just solidifying it some more. That it's by God's power and being guarded through faith for a salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. That is the salvation which is our helmet. Our helmet is the certain prospect of heaven, our ultimate salvation, which we have the anchor of our soul. Hebrews 6, 19 says, We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, Amen. the holy of holies. Now to the worldly, fleshly Corinthians who are self-centered, Divisive and confused about the resurrection, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 32, What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with the beast at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. He's being sarcastic. He's being a smart aleck. So if the Christian has no future element of salvation to look forward to, then what's the point? He said, let's eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Let's go party. 1 Corinthians 15, 19, he said this a little while early. He said, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Meaning, if all we have is the hope in this life and we have no hope in the afterlife, we of all people have to be pitied because we're a bunch of fools to think that it's just about this life and nothing after. If we have no hope in salvation, if no hope in a glorified body, and no hope of being with Christ Jesus forever in heaven, then what the hell are we doing? This is what it's saying. This is, if I ever translate the Bible, that's what I'm going to say. What the hell are we doing? <laughs> Right? Second Corinthians 4. Paul's own spiritual helmet was his firm hope in the completion of his salvation. He said, for this light. Now you got to remember this. Paul was beaten. Paul was in prison. Paul was shipwrecked. 
Paul was stranded on an island. And he wrote this, for this light momentary affliction. Light. <laughs> Most of us get mad if we get a flat tire, we're ready to throw in the towel. I give up. Can't deal with all this spiritual warfare. <laughs> the devil don't want me to go to church. No, you ran over a nail and you got a nail in your tire. It ain't got nothing to do with the devil. Paul would laugh at our major events in our life because he calls it a light momentary affliction the dude's in prison in chains not because he did something wrong it's because he did something right it's because he preached the gospel I love it whenever I go see talk to people in jail right now and they say oh, yes I feel like Paul I'm like stop <laughs> Paul didn't commit a crime. Paul didn't go do that wrong. Paul preached the gospel and was arrested. You was stupid and got arrested. Time out, bro. Oh, and someone's losing everything. I feel like Job. Time out. Job was a righteous man who didn't do anything wrong. You did this. Your stupidity made you lose your wife and your car and your house and your job. Hold on. Okay, so Paul calls it for this light, momentary affliction. It's preparing us for eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. I love how Paul writes. Because this is, you got to know the background. That's why if you're in the class, you know the background. He's in prison. Yeah. Yeah. And he's writing this, this light and momentary affliction. <laughs> <laughs> the faithful believer does not lose heart in doing good. Galatians 6, 9. Because in due time we will reap if we not grow weary. Yeah. Right. To the persecuted and the under attack Christians to whom he wrote Jude... Gave sobering warnings about false teachers. And Jude 4, he said, For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. But he began the letter by addressing believers in Jude 1. He said, Jude, a servant, watch this. This was Jesus' little brother. Who wrote this? And look how he wrote it. He could have said, Jude, Jesus' little brother. I know him. I grew up with him. But he didn't. He said, Jude, a servant of Jesus and a brother of James. You know James in the Bible? That was Jesus' other little brother. He, it's funny how he gave his servanthood to his brother Jesus. And then he named, he is the brother of James. But they were both Jesus' brother. Little brother, not older brother. No. <laughs> Some of y'all not getting that. <laughs> if there had been his older brother, that means Virgin Mary wouldn't have been a virgin. Okay. That means Jesus wouldn't be the Messiah. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James to whom, to those who are called. He's not talking to everybody. Come on. Come on. Amen. <laughs> Beloved in God the Father had kept kept for Jesus Christ. Amen. He's talking to the believers. Right. He's talking to the Christians. Yeah. Then he goes on to warn them about false teachers. You see that word kept? That is a verb and, it, and the, the Greek right there is terio, which means to guard, to keep watch over and to protect. So God himself guards, watches over and protects every person who belongs to him. Amen. Jude ended the letter by assuring believers that he keeps you from stumbling. I read that earlier. Paul also talks about it in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. He says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. We know we cannot be sanctified completely on this earth. Sanctify means to be made holy. Amen. Sanctify you completely. He's talking about glorification here. And may your whole spirit... And so, and 
see how it all comes to you? See, most of y'all thought I was full of crap. <laughs> thought of my spirit, soul, and body of being saved. You see, when you study the Bible, how it all comes together. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand. Where's the team? Y'all can come up. Now, as we wear the helmet of salvation every day, our minds become more insulated against the suggestions, against the desires, against the traps that the enemy lays for us. We have to choose to put on this helmet to guard our minds. We have to choose to guard our minds from the excessive worldly influence and instead think on the things that honor Christ. Philippians 4.8 says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And in doing so, we wear our salvation as a protective helmet that will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So when the doubt and the discouragement and everything tries to creep in, what are we to do? Put on that helmet of salvation and know without a shadow of a doubt that we are saved, that we are being sanctified, and we will be glorified in Christ Jesus. We have to stand on the things of his word and know, know that we are saved. And know that there is a hope when we die that we know that we will be in his presence. And just like Paul says, for this momentary afflictions, <clears throat> that we know that we will only go <clears throat> through a little bit here on this earth, because our life is like a vapor, and then we will be with Him for eternity. 